Hey, good morning, McFarland. Welcome to Modern Worship here this morning. My name is Pastor Trey, and on behalf of the entire staff and congregation, I want to welcome you to worship. No matter where you are or what time you are worshiping with us, you are beloved and welcomed here. I want to uh, remind you all that we'll be having service and worship today. Uh, Today I'll be using our pre-packaged communion packs to uh, remind us that no matter what you have at home, that Jesus is present in the sacrament. Um, And so hopefully that you have some kind of bread and juice so that you can participate in communion with us today. I want to encourage all of you to sign in at the link that you'll find down in the comments. Uh, This helps us know who is here, who is worshiping with us, and who we are reaching. I'd also love if you'd comment and also say hi down there to uh, see your fellow friends in worship, to share our worship service so that the wider world knows about the wonder and beauty going on here at McFarland. And now let us continue our worship as we prepare our hearts and minds to meet God in this moment. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, You breathed your life in me You've been so, so kind to me
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for your amazing love. God, we know that in your word it says that you planned each day of our lives before we were even born. And so we know, God, how much you really do love us. How amazing it is to know that you would do anything for us. We love you so much. We thank you for your grace and your amazing love. And we love you back with all that we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we continue to celebrate and look forward to what God is doing among us and through us at McFarland in 2021, in this year of authentic community, we are eager to share with you the mission and work of two important teams that will lead us in growing as disciples of Jesus Christ and how we talk to each other, listen to one another, how we learn together and wrestle with matters that are challenging and how we respond in love as those who are faithful to God's word and to living according to the example of Jesus Christ. Karen Hill and Chris Gentry are the co-chairs of our new General Conference team. You may be aware that General Conference 2020 was postponed due to the pandemic and is now scheduled to meet August 29th through September 7th of this year. Karen and Chris, can you share with us the importance of McFarland having a general conference team and what this team will be doing? Good morning, church. Although we had hoped that 2021 would be different, we've already seen chaos and confusion and dissent. More than ever, our country and our community needs our love and our light. I agreed to lead this general conference team because we know that there is no other organization more capable of changing lives that change the world than the church. The local church is the hope of the world. As Wendy mentioned to you, the global United Methodist Church may make historic decisions about marriage and ordination when they meet in August of this year. This topic has created some debate among us, and undoubtedly, it will have some effect on McFarland. We learned a lot of important lessons in 2020, and one lesson that 2020 taught us is that conversation beats debate. Debate usually requires that someone be right and someone be wrong, and that rarely leads to the best possible outcome. An honest, and passionate conversation with differing views is healthy if all persons involved seek to understand and to learn. Our purpose for this general conference team is to engage in this type of healthy dialogue, one that seeks to understand and preserve relationships. The purpose of this is to maintain the unity of our beloved church. Our hope is that we will continue to live and worship together, even with our differences. You know, there will always be big problems to solve and we the church must lead with hope, speak with love, and believe that we will solve these problems. I thank you, church. I thank you for believing with me and I thank you for being the light and the love in our world. When Rhonda and I joined McFarland as new United Methodists 17 years ago, we were struck by the welcomed diversity of thought on various issues, both in the pulpit and in the, in the small groups that we participated in. We soon learned that this is part of the rich history of the United Methodist Church, rooted in scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. Whatever the outcome of the upcoming General Conference, some fear it may fracture this rich history. However, at McFarland, we trust that our unifying mission 
of changing lives that change the world will continue to bring us together. With your help, this General Conference team will make sure that this unifying mission flourishes well into McFarland's next century. Thank you both for leading us in this important work. We're also happy to introduce Vernon Hooks and Harris Phillips, who are the co-chairs of McFarland's Just Action team. You may remember that this team was formed back in the summer of 2020 after witnessing the killings of several African-American brothers and sisters throughout the country and the protests that have continued since that time. In a time of deep racial division in our country and in our world, we need to listen and learn and respond out of love for all people. Vernon and Harris, can you share with us what the mission and the work of the Just Action Team is and why it's important for us to seek to live in the light of Christ? Hello, church. I'm Vernon Hooks, and I would like to share with you why I'm a part of Just Action Team. Growing up in Norman, I've always struggled internally not feeling truly accepted. Though I was fortunate to have incredible people in my life, society as a whole viewed me as never being, up, being able to live up to this unknown standard. I was looked down upon and despite my best efforts, there was a collective judgment that I would always fall short. Now that I'm nearly 40 years old, this is the first time I feel ready to share my experiences and that I have been asked to do so from an audience that is ready to listen. I have a six-year-old son and it is important to me that I lead by an example and look out to my community to ensure that he does not feel the same pains that I did and still do. I choose to lead this team not to speak for others, but to share my own experiences in hopes that we can grow together as an inclusive and loving congregation and community. Thank you. Morning. I feel privileged to help lead the Just Action team here at McFarland with Vernon Hooks. When Pastor Wendy sent out her email back this summer about forming a team to address racial justice issues, I felt called to get involved. At that time, I had just begun to have a better understanding of racial inequity in our country, but yet I thought God could use me to help create opportunities for God's light to shine on these issues. Vernon and I have been aided by an excellent executive committee of Zach DeFran, Michelle Dykes, and Kelly Bryan. As a team, we are working on plans for one or more speakers and for more group studies so that we can listen and learn from others who work for racial justice on a regular basis. In addition to praying for racial justice, I ask that our prayers be a call to action. And together, I am excited about what we can do here at McFarland. Thank you. Thank you both for leading us and helping us grow as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. McFarland, this is your invitation to jump in with us and be a part of preparing for General Conference and the work of the Just Action team. If you are interested in learning more about either of these teams, you can reach out to me or to the leaders of these teams or to anyone on staff at McFarland. McFarland, we are the people of God. We are people of different generations, different races, different political views, different social views, and different theological views. And yet, we are the church together, called to change lives that change the world. And we have an opportunity to model what it means to be the one body of Jesus Christ, to love one another, to respect one another, to care for one another, to listen to one another, and to live out our faith together and grow together, even if we don't agree on all things. The world 
and our community and our families and our own lives all stand in need of the wisdom and love of God in Jesus Christ that is offered through McFarland now and far into the future. We are on the move. We are living and serving in the light of God. Good morning, McFarland. I'm Eve Holly, Director of Connection Ministries here at the church. And I just want to share with you, um, as I was reading from our Soul Reset book this week, I was struck by these words. And so I want to just share them straight from the, from the book with you. It says, remember that the way of Jesus is to live lightly and freely. The burden is not meant to be heavy or overly burdensome. Our commitment to serving must always center on Jesus. I believe this is true, not only in our service for the Lord, but also in our giving to the Lord. As we come to this time of offering now, let us give not with a sense of burden, but with a renewed sense of freedom, of lightness, of joy in our giving. You may give by going to um, the link that's posted there in the, in the chat in the comment section. You can go by go using the McFarland app or even by just going to our website and clicking on the giving tab. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you that you provide everything we need and many times more than what we need. Would you please bless our giving, and would you grant us the gift of giving with a free and light heart? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our morning scripture reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Hear now the word of God. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the most common struggles people face in life today is stress-fueled exhaustion. We're talking about being burnt out and overwhelmed. No matter what church I have served or even what area of the country I've lived in, I've witnessed a common thread that people are simply tired. There's a myriad of reasons it seems like it gets more expensive to survive, let alone thrive in our world. We have more expectations being thrust upon us, many of them, quite frankly, unrealistic. We're hyper aware of every tragedy every day with every news story seemingly requiring big, bold, immediate reactions, even if we're seemingly distant from it. You factor in the basic stresses of work and school and standard levels of church and community involvement, a nap simply cannot refill our tanks. With some of you tiredly asking, what is this practice called napping that I speak of? Leaving us feeling as if we have just finished 12 rounds in the boxing ring and the bell is going off telling us it's time to hop back in. Stress is a normal part of life for everyone, but too much stress can have serious consequences for your health. Some stress is good and can trigger our fight or flight response to help us handle challenges. Stress is an unavoidable reality of life. However, with how much natural and assumed stress that we just have to deal with, we don't need to be adding stress on top of stress. Busyness, the notion of trying to control and make everything right, quickly turns to stress. And when you add stress from busyness on top of natural stress, that equation will only equal being overwhelmed. We fool ourselves in listening to the lie that keeps us from discerning the difference between natural expected stress and busyness stress where we don't even know how stressed we really are anymore. Trying to do the things we think are normal or that we have to do in order to be successful. We end up with schedules so jam-packed that there isn't a single moment in the margins, let alone any time to be with God. 
we set unrealistic expectations on ourselves and then kick ourselves when we don't reach those impossible standards. Because of this, we need to reset our spiritual expectations, unburden ourselves from this notion of being busy equals better, that stress leads to success. One of the keys to this soul reset, living freely in Christ, unburdening ourselves from the extra stress we put on already stressful situations and stress-filled lives is by practicing being in the presence of God, simply keeping company with God in and out of our daily routines. Much of our busyness and distraction stems from the noblest of intentions. We want to provide for our families. We want to give our children every opportunity to enrich their lives. We want to serve our neighbors. And yes, we even want to serve God. And yet, if all our activities leave us with no time to be still in God's presence, hear God's word, we are likely to end up anxious and troubled. We are likely to end up with a kind of life that is devoid of love and joy, resentful of others. Our call as Christians when faced with stress and busyness is to have the spiritual fortitude to always choose what Jesus calls today the better part. Not choose to try and do more, but to choose the better part in being connected to God. We can always add more to our plates, but I believe that if we focus on choosing the better things and discard the periphery things, we'll all be healthier in this attempt at a soul reset. The story of Mary and Martha demonstrates what it means to tend to the better things when they found themselves entertaining Jesus in their house. Both of them attempting to express their love, uh, but in different ways and with different outcomes. Mary knew the place to be right at that moment was seated next to Jesus, soaking up every bit of time she could get. Her priority was closeness to Jesus. Martha expressed her love for Jesus by doing. Martha was busy doing the work of hospitality and who's to blame her? Who doesn't want to ensure that everything is just right for their guests, especially when that guest is the son of God? We too want to do everything right for Jesus, don't we? We want everything to be right for our loved ones, for our community. We want our church to grow and want to alleviate as much suffering as possible. We want to climb the ladder. We want to win the rat race. The power of this piece of scripture is that it continues to be played out in our lives. We can find ourselves so busy trying to do what we think is right that we often fail to slow down long enough to simply soak in the spirit. She often gets a bad rap, though I can relate, and I think a lot of us can to Martha. If we don't take care of it, who will? She was getting stuff done, important stuff, necessary stuff, like seeing that her guests had something to eat. She was welcoming Jesus into her household. What's more important than that? People will say that the stress of the situation overwhelmed Martha, but I get anxious just hosting dinner, uh, friends for dinner. Imagine doing so for Jesus. Serving and attending to guests is not a bad thing. In fact, Jesus is constantly telling us and embodying for us how to serve others. But the aha moment here is where Luke notes that Martha is distracted by the work. The problem is not that Martha is busy serving and providing hospitality. Certainly, Jesus commands this kind of service many times, really right notably in the parable of the Good Samaritan right before this story. The problem is not her serving, but rather that she is distracted. The word translated distracted in verse 40 has the connotations of being pulled and dragged in different directions. Martha's distraction leaves no room for the most important aspect of hospitality and service, gracious attention to the guest. When we get caught up in the vicious cycle of busyness and stress, we too become distracted from the important things. Distractions caused by stress often cause us to miss divine opportunities to connect and go deeper with God and with those in our lives. Mary took a moment just to sit at the feet of Jesus. She's not excused from doing the work of ministry, but she reminds us that the activity of our lives has more focus when it is sustained by Jesus. She reminds us that our commitments must always center on Jesus, inviting us to consider a balanced life, 
a life that serves willingly and also one that prioritizes and strives to being in the presence of God. What we have here are the two components of faith, contemplation and compassion. Martha represents the Vita active, the active life, while Mary, on the other hand, represents the Vita contemplativa, the contemplative life. She sits at the feet of Jesus as a student and listens to him. Now, both the active life and the contemplative life are needed. To choose one over the other creates a false dichotomy. But Christ gently reminds Martha and us that Mary's is the better part because actions, even acts of Christian compassion and hospitality, if they are to be sustained, always follow being. That is, what we do flows naturally from who we are. Though God is always present in our lives, it's so hard to not be distracted when we worry all the time. We can miss God moving in our lives when we are stressed all the time. So we have to feed and refine our focus. Our relationship with Jesus is our focus. Growing in our understanding of who and whose we are in Jesus becomes our focus in a soul reset. Because there are always things to do, tasks to check off, work challenges to figure out, packed school schedules to juggle, ministries to be a part of. But sometimes we need to push the pause button on all those things and just sit with Jesus. I have to admit, contemplation and rest are not my natural state of being. I'm a doer. I find fulfillment in accomplishing tasks. I'm the kind of person who has his weekly schedule down to the hour on his notes app on his phone and checks them off all throughout the day. Taking time off, turning off my email and my brain is not something I'm great at. Now, this was generally fine before my daughter Sloan was born. If I had a late night meeting or a church activity, it happens. But then came dinner time and bedtime routines, and I felt myself pulled in different ways, distracted, as the Word of God says. But it wasn't just time and scheduling that was a balancing act, but my internal compass started swaying all over the place. Returning to work after a month of paternity leave, part of me was excited to be back in the saddle, while another part of me missed the constant presence of Sloan. But then I'd feel this pressure to have to perform well and succeed at church, wanting to provide for Sloan and make sure she was taken care of. In the back of my mind was the Sunday night service we had tried to start at church and how, though there were some fruits from it, uh, it objectively crashed and was eventually ended after six months. The stress of wanting to succeed, I began to take it personally if someone didn't return to worship as if I hadn't made a compelling enough sermon or created enough connection points for them to feel welcomed. What if that happened again? What if I failed? Where would we get moved to? What kind of life would Sloan have? That kind of stress It didn't inspire me to be a better pastor, but translated into overworking and not being as present of a parent as I wanted. And I bet that my experience in being tugged and pulled and stressed about success isn't that unique to some of y'all watching. It's easy to read Jesus say that Mary chose the better part and so should we. But like my struggle as a parent and a pastor, we all find ourselves seemingly in either or losing situations. Jesus was right there in front of Martha. She was even doing what she was supposed to do in the presence of Jesus, but because she became distracted by all the extra stuff and the pressures and trying to find her identity and the busyness, she was distracted from the fact that Jesus was right there in front of her. What I had to do in my eventual return from paternity leave, and it's something that I still have to work on to this day, I have to consider what belongs to me, what responsibilities belong to others, and what belongs to God. I cannot carry burdens that don't belong to me. The hope of a soul reset is to help you discover how to live lightly and freely in Jesus. Following Jesus is not meant to weigh us down or be overly burdensome. When Jesus' very presence is our first priority, we can lift our eyes from the long list of tasks and to be done and instead focus on our greater purpose. 
Exhaustion's not the way of Jesus. Yes, Jesus was always on the move, but he always stopped to be present when someone called out to him. He saw those nobody else saw, heard cries from people others had stopped listening to. Jesus knew how to be present with people in the, even in the busyness and sometimes chaos of life. Even when facing arrest and the toughest stretch of his earthly life, Jesus still made time to sit and share a meal with his friends. To start this new year, Pastor Wendy has been leading our staff in making SMART goals for both our specific ministry departments and our personal lives. My goal is the goal of presence. I can get caught up in work, and what's so bad about that is my work is the work of Christ, and yet it's still work, and it can lead me to forget Jesus. When I'm distracted around Sloan, like trying to watch the Browns game, or I'm checking Facebook on my phone, Sloan will just walk up and, and grab my face and move it to where I'm looking her in the eye. Sometimes she'll even walk across the room and just stare at me to get my attention. The good news for us who are distracted and stressed and busy is that new rhythms and patterns of life are soon to be emerging. I found in my life that a silver lining to COVID is that it disrupted some unhealthy work patterns in my life. The good news is that there is a light emerging at the end of this dark tunnel, and with it, we will have another disruption of patterns. But this time, we can be ready for it. We can prepare for it. Can we be more present people, having been reminded of the power of presence on the other end of pandemic? As our world changes and society and work life shifts, can we be intentional in our soul reset to reset the practices of exhaustion and stress, instead emphasizing our relationship with Jesus? Because this relationship shifts our attitudes, elevates our thinkings, and allows us to release our pent up emotions. Particularly when there's so much negativity and stress and we are overwhelmed by all that is going in our lives and, and in our world, we need to spend more moments sitting at the feet of Jesus, hear the good news of God's story of salvation, grace, and love. I know that I need to be reminded that there's a God who is bigger than whatever I'm going through, who hears and sees and knows and is with me in my struggle. Both listening and doing, receiving God's word and serving others are vital to the Christian life, just as inhaling and exhaling are to breathing. Yet how often do we forget to breathe in deeply? Trying to serve without being nourished by God's word is like expecting good fruit to grow from a tree that has been uprooted. My siblings in Christ, may you find yourself rooted at the feet of Christ. Amen. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal There's rest for the weary, 
rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. Dearly beloveds, I'm so thankful that you have made a commitment, made a moment to be with us today, that just like the disciples who were living chaotic and crazy lives, that they were able to come to the table to be with Jesus, knowing that this moment, it matters, that this meal, it matters to us. It centers us. It makes sure that we know that we are forgiven and loved by a God who lived lives just like us. God's love took on flesh to be with us so that we could know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us, that God has a promise for us. And so we gather around this meal just like Jesus and his disciples did over 2,000 years ago, to remember the promise that Jesus took bread, blessed it, gave thanks to you, Almighty God, and in taking the bread, he broke it, gave thanks to all that you have done, and passed it to his friends and said, take, eat, eat. This is my body. This is my life that I give for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then as the uh, supper wore on, Jesus likewise took a cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, said, take, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. This is my love poured out for you, but not just for you, but for the world so that they might know this new covenant of grace and redemption. Would you please pray with me? Almighty and present God, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, that they might be the grain of the field, the fruit of the vine, that they might be the bread of life, the cup of salvation, so that we may be 
the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, make us one with each other, and make us one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. For all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now, wherever you are, I invite you to partake in communion. If you are um, watching and celebrating and worshiping with someone else at your house, I'd encourage you to um, serve one another to remind us that Christ serves us and that through Christ we serve the world. If you need to pause worship service for a moment to get your communion elements uh, ready, um, that is okay. But whenever you are ready, I invite you to partake in the sacrament of Holy Communion. The body of Christ given for you. The cup of salvation poured out for you. having been forgiven, having received grace, let us join together in the prayer that Jesus first taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, just as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come into this time of, of our congregational prayer where we, where we pray together, um, I invite you, um, as we've talked about being, being stressed and burdened, I invite you just to, to relax, to perhaps even open your hands and, and lay them gently in your lap as we go to God in prayer. Father God, you who have made us and know us and love us unconditionally, you who are the, the lover of our souls and the lifter of our heads, the one to whom we look and you give us what we need. Lord, your eyes are always upon us. And so, Lord, we ask today that you you help us to keep our eyes on you, that we make that connection with you by stopping and listening and just being with you. For there is no other place that is so peaceful, that is so perfect, that is so comforting and encouraging as to be in your presence. Lord, today we confess that that we hit the ground running from morning to bedtime. We have things to do, places to go, things to accomplish, problems to solve, people to care for. But Lord, we're reminded this day that we have a God who came to be in relationship with us, who came to be with us and like us, to walk with us, and to carry us when we are weak and when it is hard, to give us guidance and counsel. And so, Lord, in the midst of our day, may we stop. Help us to listen carefully. Help us to take the help that you extend to us every moment of every day. Help us to listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit that you have put within us when we believe that you are there. You are here with us. We hold up to you the events of our world and we, we present them to you, Lord, and ask you to help us. We hold up the plight of our country and our nation, of our city, of our neighborhood, of our family, of our souls. And we ask you, Lord, help us. We praise you that you are a God of mercy and that you are a God of unending grace poured out on us 
not because of anything that we do, but because of who you are. And we lean into that grace and that love as we lean into a, the breast of a parent whose arms then come around us gently and lovingly, comforting, encouraging, strengthening us so that then we can move forward knowing that we are loved. We praise you. We thank you. We look to you. Help us to follow you more closely, not with a heavy burden, but freely and lightly following you, Lord Jesus. And we pray all these things in your powerful, holy, and precious name. Amen. on this journey I get lost in my mistakes but it looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength my story isn't over my story's just begun I feel you want to find me cause that's what my father does I feel you want to find me cause that's what my father does Ooh.
As we go forth from this place, know that you have time that Jesus is readily available to you anytime, anywhere, and in any space. I hope that you all have a wonderful week, that you spend time reconnecting with a God who loves you so much that you can take off the burdens of busyness and that you might find a soul reset. May you go in peace. Amen.